Welcome to THA Talks, for free thought and open minds. Hello, I'm Paul Obertelli and welcome to another edition of THA Talks, the alternative podcast show from the UK. Our talks include news, conspiracies, spirituality, the occult, science, history, art, philosophy, religion and much more. If you'd like to check out our full archive, just go to www.thatalks.com to listen to or to download all our free content. And if there's anyone who'd like to contact us and give us some feedback, maybe you'd like to recommend a guest for the show, you can email us info at thatalks.com. Or you can go to our website and follow the contact tab there. And don't forget, you can subscribe to the show via our RSS feed, and you can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher and many other podcast directories out there. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in again. I hope you've all been enjoying the summer. I certainly have. We've had some really good sunshine here in the UK, and I've really enjoyed it. I'm a bit disappointed to see start seeing signs of it starting to walk the other way, the sun. But it has been pretty good, and uh, we've, I'm, I'm hoping that there's still going to be a few more weeks that I can enjoy. And um, in a way, I'm sorry again for the break. Um, I think it, it's just the summer, really, isn't it? It's, there just tends to be more things going on and busy with work or working extra bits and pieces so I can do other bits and pieces, and you know how it is. But I'm glad to be back with you here this evening, and we're going to be covering the subject of Odinism, Arsa True. And uh, for those of you that have listened to the show a lot, you'll know that I've had a bit of a venture myself through paganism and spirituality in general, and I've been quite vocal about that on the show. So um, I think maybe you guys are probably just as familiar with my own uh, ventures as I am, to be honest, um, talking about it on this podcast. Me and and Mr. David Parry is not here today, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I think, I think um, it's... For me, it's kind of paganism is something that's really come to me, although it's very difficult for me to, to explain what I am as such. I mean, I, I use the word, I use the word, um, are so true, but there's so many pieces that are missing from the Abrahamic faith that have destroyed a lot of paganism all around the world, but definitely we're missing it here in Europe and stuff. So it's, it's almost like a, a slightly frustrating path, but a fascinating one at the same time. But I'm delighted to be bringing on Ralph Harrison onto the podcast today. Now, Ralph is the uh, well, the, the founder and director of Odinist Fellowship. It's a, a group here in the UK of Odinists and um, preserving and 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 uh, developing the movement over here. And he's had some fantastic ideas and I've been looking forward to getting Ralph on the show. And I think without further ado, we should just crack on and go and speak to him. <music> Hi there, Ralph. Welcome to the show. Good evening. Well, um, I'm pleased you've come on the show. Uh, we've we've covered a lot of subjects on paganism and us are true and different kinds of paganism. And um, we haven't quite yet had someone on the show that's actually a part of a, an organisation that's out there, especially in the UK, doing their thing. So you're, the, the Odinist Fellowship. Um, maybe we could start off if you could just sort of tell us how, how the Od- Odinist Fellowship came about, the idea behind it. And um, it's it's what what its what it, what its goals are, so to speak. Yeah, certainly. Um, well, we're here to promote and propagate and practice Odinism. Odinism is a religion. Odinism is the name that we give to the original indigenous native religion of the English people. That's to say, the religions that existed at the time the Christian missionaries came along, this is the religion which they encountered. Um, It's therefore the religion of uh, Anglo-Saxon and Jutish um, ancestors, and likewise of the related Germanic-speaking peoples of the continent who today are represented by the people of Germany, Holland, and Scandinavia. So um, Odinism is the old Northern European religion in that sense. But um, it has been restored since the 1980s. Today, 
um, because we think it's a viable alternative to Christianity, which is falling into decline and has been rejected for various reasons, ideological and moral and other reasons. And Odinism makes a great deal more sense. In a way, it's a great deal more modern in outlook, um, despite the fact that it is a very ancient religion whose origins are lost in the mists of time. Mm. So the Odinist Fellowship exists um, to, as I say, to practice, promote and propagate Odinism. Perhaps the most important of those is to practice it. You have to practice the religion. Um, the Odinist Fellowship is a registered charity. It um, was the first non-monotheistic uh, religious organization to be registered as a charity in England and as the head of advancement of religion. And it's still one of a very small number of um, pagan registered charities. Um, this means that the Charity Commission has looked at our aims and objects and activities and verified that we do comply, as it were, with the definition in English law of a religion. Um, so it's an act of recognition as far as we're concerned. Um, the um, Odinist Fellowship has... Uh, uh, has um, various activities, um, but mainly it's um, organized um, as far as possible in house groups, uh, which, uh, of which there are perhaps uh, half a dozen or, or, or maybe getting on for a dozen now um, throughout the country. And um, it, these people um, welcome people into the house and, and practice the rites and celebrate the festivals mm. uh, in what we call hearths or house groups. Um, so far, we only have one actual temple, which is in Newark on Trent, Nottinghamshire. Um, but we hope this will be the first of many. Right. Well, um, well I mean, I know, I know you're you've got some plans to actually um, talk to some churches that are either not in use or not being used very much, and you you're trying to sort of see if you can actually get the churches to allow Odinist worship in these temples. Is that how, how is that is that progressing? Um, yes. I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Odinism because I think that um, many of your listeners will be very unfamiliar with it and okay. will be asking themselves, well, what? I've given a rather dry and dusty um, definition of Odinism just to put it in a historical context. Mm. But Odinism is a religion. So um, what a religion is essentially, getting to the very essence of it, is that it's a form of spirituality which is, helps the believer, the adherent, be he male, female, or child, to establish a relationship between himself and the Godhead, that is to say, the gods and the goddesses, the gods, in our case, the gods and goddesses of the northern pantheon. So it's about establishing a spiritual and personal relationship with the gods. Now, it's in the nature of polytheism, of course, that we have a very large number of gods and goddesses, and it often is the case uh, in practice, that individuals have a particular devotion or a particular feeling of um, amity towards uh, one or two or three of these gods and goddesses. So someone may be in particular a devotee of Odin, another person may be a devotee of Freya, or, or it may be a bit more complex than that. But we honor all the gods and goddesses, particularly in our communal worship, but um, in terms of a personal relationship and personal devotions, it may be very a very varied experience, differing from one Odinist to another, so that there is um, a friendship, this is how I would put it, because unlike Christianity, where there's a huge gulf in the theology between the individual and this absolute, infinite, transcendent deity, that is ultimately unknowable, our gods are part of nature and they're closer to us. They are greater than us, more powerful than us, but they're not altogether alien towards us and they are uh, much closer in kind to us. So that sort of relationship is much more possible. And the key element in this, although belief is important, the key element for an Odinist is loyalty or fidelity, or allegiance, or 
beauty. It says a number of words which mean more or less the same thing. So it's a question of being loyal to the gods and espousing their cause because the gods represent the principle of the natural order, life, creativity, um, goodness, and um, uh, and and um, nature, and as I say, the natural order, as distinct from chaos. We have a view in which really we don't take for granted the existence of the world around us, the universe around us, and the uh, natural order around us. It's on a knife edge. This is the message that comes across through the myths. So um, the gods are always battling and striving to keep this natural order, which is threatened from all sorts of sources. And our role in life, I suppose, is to see how we, within our own lives, within our own um, um, uh, situations in life, can, can work with the gods to preserve and uphold this natural order mm. and all the good things, creativity, inventiveness, the family, you know, art, literature, all these things which are good and positive and wholesome, um, these are the things we strive to maintain. Right. Sorry, I, did I miss the question? No, that that was, that was um, brilliant. That, that was a perfect description and um, sounded very oh, European. You were, asking, you were asking about our relationships with the churches, weren't you? That's it, yeah. Um, yes. Um, I mean, as I say, we have one, it's been a long-standing ambition because we are a religion, and like any religion, we have houses of worship. In the ancient times, we had many, many houses of worship. Probably, I think, in England, they were rather like um, uh, the longhouse style of building, so fairly simple. Um, but in um, in some countries, um, we believe that they were much more magnificent uh, churches, uh, sorry, temples, that were almost on a cathedral-like scale, particularly in Uppsala in Sweden, where there are references and descriptions of that. Um, but um, we naturally have this ambition to um, have a net national network of um, Odinist temples, Partly that would aid in the recognition of the religion, but it's also a practical thing that we can meet together and we can use these not just for worship, but for community activities as well. Um, so, of course, that entails money, which um, it often comes and rears its ugly head in these matters. And we set up a fund which for many years uh, faithful owners have been contributing towards. We were able to raise a certain amount of money and afford one rather small but very beautiful little building, as I say, in the English East Midlands in Nottinghamshire, and we would hope to replicate that. Now, we have approached the church, but our main, uh, the Church of England in particular, but our main aim in approaching the church is actually to extract from the church a recognition of its past wrongs, because uh, any other organization other than a church, if it had a history of what the church has done, its, um, its murders, its, its tortures, its killings, its maimings, its persecutions, its acts uh, totally in defiance of uh, human rights, any organization, whether it was a political party or some other type of organization that had had a record like that would be wound up, would not be tolerated, uh, you know, after the Second World War the Nazi party was disbanded. No one tried to reform it. It was disbanded because of its crimes. But the church is um, vested apparently in this aura of sanctity so that even though um, the institutional church has committed numerous crimes uh, in the past in terms of persecution, not just against Odinists, but against all the original pagan religions of Europe, um, it somehow allowed this is allowed to be forgotten about but we don't want it to be forgotten about we want to highlight this um i think just to add a contemporary note we're seeing in uh, the southern united states a lot of these confederate statues oh. being removed um this is a sort of historical revisionism what i think that we need to knock down a lot of the saints from their pedestals as well mm. you know saint um olaf uh a patron saint of norway who was one of the bloodiest tyrants that ever ruled in Europe, um, St. Dominic, you know, whose um, Dominicans were the Dominicanes, the hounds of the Lord, who, who 
persecuted their way through Europe and many, many more that you could mention uh, that they are still um, worshipped, venerated and honoured and I think that the church needs to come to terms with um, the crimes of the past. Now we have nothing whatsoever against ordinary, everyday church-going Christians. That's not what, what our aim is. It's about uh, tackling the institutional church and of course, when it comes to um, property, um, you're quite right in saying that the institutional church um, actually founded its its current um, property empire. It is one of the biggest property owners in the entire country still. You know, before the Reformation, it had about a third of the property and land in England belonged to the church. It's not quite at that level now, but it still is a major portfolio holder in terms of property and other wealth. Um, but it founded its property on property that was confiscated from other religions, and that other religion in England was Odinism, was the original Anglo-Saxon religion. And um, the church's own historians give details of this and the documentary evidence of how Augustine, when he um, came to Kent as bishop, um, asked the Pope, Pope Gregory at the time, for advice as to how he should proceed with the with the Odinist temples, with the heathen temples that he encountered, and the Pope, very wisely, worldly wisely, you might say, um, instructed him not to destroy them, but to take hold of them, to seize them, to confiscate them, and then um, uh, splash around a bit of holy water and throw out the so-called idols, in other words, the images of the gods and goddesses, and um, install the Christian uh, paraphernalia in that and take it over as a church. And this is what has happened throughout a very large section of the country, so that the many, many, probably hundreds of um, old Saxon foundation churches uh, that belong to the Church of England are founded on land that was originally uh, occupied by some sort of shrine or temple belonging to us Odinists. Now, we can't turn back the clock of history. I'm well aware of that. But I think just as a token gesture of reconciliation, the church ought to hand over a couple of its superfluous and redundant churches to the people that it originally um, tried to eradicate and confiscate out of existence and it would just be a small gesture of um <clears throat> of reconciliation it sounds like so a great idea so we're asking really for one church in the archdiocese of canterbury one church in the archdiocese of york to be handed over to us to be converted into openness temples a little bit cheeky you might say but that's our um ploy at the moment no that's i mean it's, it's thinking about when, when you're saying that i it seems to me a lot of the places around the country, be it Stonehenge, Avebury, and I've just recently gone to Portland where there were some areas there, pagan areas, there were some stone circles that the Christian mm. took the rocks and they were a bit superstitious, so they actually kept them in the in the walls around the area because mm. they felt... Mm. And it just seems like people generally, tourists, they're, they're more interested in the more ancient, the pagan... So even, they even visit churches because the church was supposedly a, a pagan temple at one stage or built on top of a mm. pagan temple. Mm. So it's almost like consciously, I think people are wanting to connect with the more ancient spirituality, yeah, because perhaps because so. it's absent. And even the New Testament in in, the, in Christianity is kind of almost like influenced by paganism. It was almost like where the Abrahamists put that there because it was it it would have been more tempting for the pagans because you had certain similar sort of themes to it. And um, mm. I think it's I think it's great that people are pulling back, but. What what I'd like to touch on briefly, I mean, it's um, I, I suppose a, a negative area of of, of the the community at the moment or, or in, in in England and I think in America is there seems to be a division in in what it actually means. You've got I, I guess you've got in this country at least it's us are true and Odinists and um, the, I, I guess you, we've got to call it what it is. It seems to be a kind of a left and right divide, which which is which I think we can all see it's going rampant around the world at the moment. What are your views I, on that? And I how wouldn't do you... really um, accept that analysis, actually, right. Paul, with all due respect. Um, Odinism, as I say, it, we tend to be a little bit Anglo-centric because we're English and we look at things from an English point of view. But the reality is that Odinism doesn't belong 
to England, didn't derive exclusively in England. Its, its homeland is also in Germany, in Holland, and in Scandinavia, and in Iceland. And of course, Iceland, to, to 13th century Iceland, we are enormously indebted for the um, preservation of so much of the myth law and the Eddas in particular, but also the sagas and uh, mm. Heimskringla and lots of other sources of information about the religion without which our modern day attempts to restore the religion would be would be um, stymied. Um, so we're enormously indebted to um, those literary giants and poets of the um, 13th century Iceland in particular uh, uh, and other, other contributors as well to the myth law, but, but them in particular. Um, and of course, there are different languages, and they're very different. Although they're all Germanic languages, they all have a common root. They have moved very much apart. English is is um, quite a different language from German now, and quite a different language from the Scandinavian languages. So we have different words um, for the same things. Um, so in English, uh, we think it's normal to use the term Odinism to describe the old uh, Teutonic religion, um, but uh, this is an English-sounding word, and in Iceland and other Scandinavian countries, they use variants of the form Ausatru. Ausatru is a modern um, neologism in Icelandic, meaning faith in the Aesir or the gods, and um, that is how the Icelanders prefer to use it. Uh, and in Germany, which we mustn't leave out of the equation because it is, after all, the most populous of the Germanic-speaking countries, um, they use the term Deutsche Glaube, meaning German belief. But these are um, perfectly appropriate within their own context. So I don't see any difference whatsoever um, between these. It's just a difference of language. <clears throat> right. Um, uh, you, you say between left and right. I'm sure there are people who are left, people who are right, people who are central uh, in their politics, and people who um, probably don't have any politics at all or have their own particular ideas. But we are a religion, not a political system, and it's very important to emphasize that, that we are putting forward a religious idea. And when I come together, when we come together, I should say, with other Odinists, um, at our at our festivals and at our gatherings, um, even though I'm meeting people, some people I've never met before from different work, walks of life, with different interests and different educational attainments, different backgrounds, and yet there's I have felt this overwhelming sense of unity and a sense of common purpose and a common ideal, and that I think derives from the fact that. However much we may have quite a, a variety of different opinions and interpretations of the religion, we all agree on honoring the same set of gods, the same families of gods. So it's the Asia and the Vani, the gods of the north, the high gods of Asgard, which are all different ways of saying the same thing, the northern pantheon of deities. These are our gods. We are loyal to them and we believe they are loyal to us. So it's that overwhelming sense of common purpose which just sort of fades uh, causes to fade away all other extraneous factors I find when we gather together so I haven't encountered this um, personally um, this um, uh, the, the, this scenario which which you're describing mm. okay well I mean I wanted to touch on some like experiences based i mean perhaps this is this is a personal question if it is feel free to throw it back at me but i mean have you have you actually you obviously working very hard and very passionate about this whole thing have you have you actually had any personal experience with deity like that that made you made you so passionate about it or was it more of a historical thing and and something like that um, I think we all have our personal experiences and they they uh, often reflect our different characters and different personalities. So for some people, um, some people write, I, I, I have hundreds of letters written to me by different people, so I have quite a wide range of different views, I hear lots of different uh, personal stories, and there are some people for whom um, the relationship with the gods is one of visions and dreams and person encounters like that, 
And there are others for whom it's just a very strong, deep-running, emotional um, sense of abiding presence. So I think the encounter with the gods will differ from person to person. I do believe that the gods from time to time um, make their presence felt among us in very particular ways. And this is something that you could call a visitation um, and that they, uh, you would encounter um, what appears at first sight to be a human being who may speak to you or may pass you in the street simply and is in a way a manifestation of that God. This is rare, but it does happen and is described. Um, if I could jump from, from uh, the northern religion to um, the southern religion of the Greeks, which is very similar in many ways, different in other ways. But if you read Homer, you see this all the time. With It's always Athene in Homer, and Athene appears um, to give some advice to the hero, um, and the hero at first, she appears in different guises, and the hero is not at first aware, but when she disappears, then the hero realizes that he's had a visitation from the goddess. Now, Athene in, in the Iliad and the Odyssey is appearing under a disguise. I think our gods maybe appear in their, in their normative guises, you know, in their standard um, uh, iconographical guises rather than in the disguise. But it's very similar, I think. I think those things do occur. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the I've never, I've never personally had an, an experience with a deity, so to speak, but for example, well, cause I've read a lot about, uh, or, or the meaning behind Nord. Um, I was, as I said, I was at, I was at Portland recently uh, just by pulpit rocks and just the energy I felt there just coming, around. obviously cause I've read a lot about it and I just felt it was just there. Mm. I felt I can mm. understand why him as a deity represent what I could understand what he represents or what represents him mm -hmm. whatever way. Interesting. But it's, um, yeah. I'd highly recommend Portland for some. It's very fresh mm -hmm. in, my, in my head at the moment. Um, I haven't been there myself actually, but um, I think also just walking in nature sometimes um, and, and nature itself is full of spirits. Mm. Uh, you know, the earth is a living being and there are, and it's invested with, Spirit, spirits and spirituality and there are real spirits all around us i mean i have a spirit you have a spirit so there are million human beings have spirits so there are millions of, of spirits in the world mm. which are human at the human level but there are other forms of spirit as well and we live in a world of spirits really um you can walk in the woods maybe at dusk when um the dimming light you know sort of sort of lulls your your, your rational senses a little bit and see or sense um, some abiding spirit of the wood or you can um, be sitting looking at a waterfall and thinking, what is this that I'm actually... It's a living creature that I'm actually looking at. I mean, that obviously is not the rational scientific point of view. And nothing in Odinism conflicts with um, science or scientific theory or scientific discoveries at all, nothing whatsoever. But we do add a different perspective, which is a spiritual perspective to life as well. Yeah. Um, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to, well, not something different, but just uh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your views on this. And I mean, if you look at a lot of other pagan uh, faiths, be it Wicca or some of the Druids, and um, and even some of the occult practices, some of the following the, the likes of Alistair Crowley, Israel, Israeli mm -hmm. Regardi, and or of these occultists. Um, what's your opinion um, on that kind of stuff within Odinism? I mean, do you think that do you, do you know of or are you interested yourself in the magical practice? I mean, there's evidence that our ancestors did practice that as well, 
Um, oh, yeah. more, you've asked more... quite a few different questions there, but I'll answer, I'll answer the, the, the floor is the floor is your yours, mate. First. Take it. <laughs> uh, I have actually written a little book called "Is Wicker Pagan," examining Gerald oh. Gardner's writings and um, how the development of his ideas, uh, the origin of his ideas, and the development of his ideas, and how they've been retranslated as pagan. Um, Gerald Gardner himself, who's the founder of Wicca, which is the you know um, the biggest. Uh, Ocratist type organization and movement in this country and in America um, hardly ever referred to paganism in his works. And uh, I think I counted in one of his works, uh, Witchcraft Today, uh, four mentions of the word pagan or its derivatives. And in one case, that related to um, Islam. He actually describes that as paganism. So he had no concept of being of Wicca being pagan. He was interested in witchcraft, which at least is honest. Um, so nowadays you find that a lot of Wiccans try to disguise witchcraft under the umbrella, under the cosmetic of pagan. Uh, it's a soubriquet which seems more anodyne to, um, to the public. Um, but they're not pagan in the sense of being a historic uh, Pre-Christian, authentic, hysteric, historically authentic form of polytheism, which which pre-existed Christianity. Now, I've just come back on a brief holiday to Latvia, where I was um, very welcomed by the Dievturiba people in Latvia. And Latvia, you may not know anything about this, but it has a very ancient pre-Christian, polytheistic, pagan tradition, which is therefore analogous completely different, but analogous to Odinism and is their own respective um, indigenous form of pre-Christian religion, which they have also been reviving since the 1920s in the case of Latvia and Lithuania, where it's very, very strong. And I had the wonderful pleasure of visiting their lovely little thatched temple on a little island in the Daugava River. Um, and it was, it was wonderful to see the progress that they had made um, that's genuine paganism, and there's a revival throughout Europe in different parts. In Finland, as I say, in Lithuania, in Greece, they have a temple as well. They're going to build a temple in Iceland, so we understand, which is great, and also in America. So we're moving on to a new stage. But with Wicca, um, you're talking about really the occult. Now, you also asked about magic. Well, we mustn't um, equate the occult with magic. Yes, I believe in magic because magic, it, my definition of magic is, um, is a, a, a form of action um, of prayer put into action which allow, invites the gods, the divine powers to act in, in our lives uh, in the physical domain to change things which otherwise would not be changed. So it's a form of intensified prayer, if you like. And our celebration of the Cup of Remembrance, where we uh, sacrifice the mead in the trigill or sacred bowl, um, is a form of magic. It actually accomplishes what we set out to accomplish with it. The gods do answer our prayers. Um, but anyone can pray, say a simple prayer, and if, if they mean it, and if they're sincere, and if they address the gods in the right way, and the right god for the right purpose, as it were, then there's no reason, uh, given the contingency for fate and so forth, there's no reason why that prayer should not be answered. So I believe there's huge power in religion and in magic. Right. Yes. And uh, do you, does the Odinist, um, Odinist fellow, Fellowship, does that... Uh, promote any movements that, that are into sort of magic practice? Um, As I say, the Cup of Remembrance, which is our central um, service, can be understood as in a magical way. Right. Um, people may have difficulty accepting that if their um, understanding of magic is, is very skewed by their um, experience of the occult or their reading about the occult, because it's not an occult Form. It's, not, it's not reserved for the few. It's open, it's public, but that's what magic was. And people made sacrifices in the olden days, 
not just in Northern Europe, but throughout Europe, throughout the pagan world, um, offering the gods gifts to express their love, but also to ask for favors, the, the favors that we need, the favors for survival, the favors for, um, you know, good crops, happy marriage, all these sort of things. And whatever you desire, as long as it's honorable and reasonable, I would say, then you can ask that of the gods and the sacrifice, which the couple remembers is, is a way of intensifying that. Uh, and if you think of the old social customs of the North, you give a gift, you, you expect a gift in return, or a gift is given to you in return as a matter of course. This is a gift is by gift, gifts requited. This is the old customary law of the North, uh, the law of hospitality. And um, this is what is at play here. Right. So basically, I mean, if there was a, a magician that's researched his tech or her, her technique and ideas, that all they really just need to do is apply apply it with loyalty and devotion to the the the. Um, Odinist pantheon, you know the the gods, the the Norse gods, um, and that would and that would it, it would be a personal thing to them, but that would still be effective in terms of their relationship with that deity. Yes, um, the occultists tend to view the gods or the spirits. They don't really, I don't think, really believe in gods, but they sort of believe in spirits as um, uh, entities that they can command, that they can. Um, order around, mm. and um, they just have to um, uh, do the right hickory pokery, and um, uh, they get these spirits sort of jumping around at their command. That is not our concept. Mm. The gods are higher than us, but they are they are loving and benign and benevolent. Uh, you know, particularly if we respond to them with loyalty and fidelity. So. There is a relationship there, and just as if I have, I think of the gods as friends in high places. So we have friends in high places, and that's a very fortunate situation to be in. And if I have a friend in high places, and I want to go to him and say, I really need a favor, would you kindly do this, and it's in his power to do so, then he may do that for me. See, so it's a very similar relationship to that. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess with with some of these occultists, I mean, they can think that they're channeling something that they think they're asking for, but really, do they really have any idea what's behind the the, the curtain? You know, for all they know, it could be something totally different to what they think they're getting. So, I've always thought it's fascinated me, and I think there's a lot of uh, fascinating ideas behind rituals and this kind of stuff. But I do question I think some occultists. Of, um, uh, and, and particularly Crowley, and Crowley has had a great deal of influence on occultism in Britain and America. Uh, Crowley was a very uh, egotistical person, and he basically thought that magic was emanating from his own great, wonderful brain mm. and mind and spirit, and it came from him, and he was a source of magic. Well, I disagree with that. I don't think it is the operator, to use that technical term, that is a source of of the magical power that is the source of the uh, of of the supernal power. I think it is the gods, and they channel it through us because we ask them, and we ask them. But in a particular way, there are fixed ways of asking. You don't ask the god of war um, to help you in a love match. You don't ask the god of peace to help you win a war. You have to direct your wishes, your prayers, your petitions in the right way with the right phrasing. You have to be informed, mythically informed, um, and you have to um, use appropriate language. This isn't to say that you have, uh, that it's very obtruse. It's just that you have to um, be within the mindset and the, uh, the mythic um, mindset of Odinism, if this is what we're talking about, in order to address your prayers correctly. But we have in the Book of Rites, which is our published liturgy, a form of, of magic. If someone came up to me and said, I have a sick relative, can you, can you help? We can pray together, we can, we can, do, we can perform the cup of remembrance uh, for, for that person, 
that's not a problem. And it often achieves very beneficial results. One has to be very careful with sickness because, you know, no one is going to live forever. So there will be fatal sicknesses. Um, so we don't want to give false hope, but and everything was, is within the remit of fate in our theology. So you have to understand that that even the gods are not absolute. So, but they do have power and they can exert that power. And there's no reason why we cannot apply ourselves to use it. Mm. Yeah, no, fascinating. Uh, I'd like to touch. I mean, I'm going to touch on my personal experience into um, Odinism and be, uh, being drawn towards it. I mean, I've been into paganism or, or different sort of pagan movements and spiritual movements for many years now, and it's led me straight to Odinism. And while I feel that I've very much been pushed in the right direction, I feel a very strong pull, a rooting to this, to these, to these deities and a belonging to them. Um, at the same time, there's almost like for me a frustration because there's some there's such great depth to what we have. We have you know from the Eddas and other bits and pieces that we have. It's such great depth that I connect to, but also a slight frustration because there's there's a cutoff that we know there's there was probably so much more that's been lost. Yes, how, yes. What, what advice would you give to people that that are in position like I'm? How how do you construct an understanding and uh, you know an anchor to, to this religion knowing that there's so much that's been lost the advice that I would give is to proceed with with humility actually we none of us are uh, for the reasons you have given that the, the knowledge that's been transmitted to us has survived so far to us so we're, we're wonderfully indebted to it it is still fragmentary and we um, are are groping in the dark, as it were, and we can't ever claim to be as well versed in the law and uh, the, the mythology and the knowledge of the religion, and the knowledge of its spirituality, as our ancestors, who had a, an unbroken tradition of centuries uh, behind them, whereas we have that broken tradition and we're picking up the pieces and fitting them together. So we have to, um, the first piece of advice, I would say, proceed with caution and with humility. There are some people who say, oh, I want to rewrite the myths. Uh, I think this is a very disastrous thing. We're not, we, none of us are at such a, uh, a far advanced state of knowledge and understanding that we can put ourselves into that position. The other advice I would give, um, obviously, Odinists, do tend to, owners of all education attainments do tend to be very, very well read um, in the Eddas and the other items of literature, the other sources of literature um, uh, of, of the Northern literature. Uh, but I would say um, that we have to respect and um, abide by the principles of sound scholarship so that we are very much indebted to the scholars uh, they're not often not believers themselves, but they have a very wide knowledge of all the literature, including some obscure texts that are not readily available to most of us. Um, they have spent a lifetime studying these in the original languages, and they, uh, their interpretations, their, um, their glosses on the, on the meaning of uh, the texts and their attempt to enlighten uh, the, uh, some of the more obscure elements of it. Um, these uh, are, on the, uh, are, are developed on the basis of sound scholarship, and that is how we should proceed, rather than on wild, um, unsupported, um, you know, rather kooky and eccentric theories. Stick to sound scholarship, and you won't go too far wrong. Right, well, that, that sounds like good advice. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I, we, I've spoken to people on the show before about um, the Vedic scriptures that some people believe that, I mean, that's the real underlaying root of of religions like the Norse religions, the Celtics that were around Britain and Europe at the time, and and also the, the Greek, uh, that you touched on the Greek pantheon. Uh, all of this was seeded from this really ancient spirituality. Is that something that's interested you as well? Um, I'm sure it is enormously interesting, but um, it is something that is ultimately different. It's a different body of, of literature. Mm. And I think that we have probably absorbed elements from the Indo-European 
heritage, but also elements from pre-Indo-European, that's to say, um, from, from peoples of Europe, who spoke languages other than the Indo-European and which are now uh, n- are no longer e- extant. So there, there was probably a mixture of different language groups and different, um, a different formula of mixtures in different parts of Europe, which has given rise to um, uh, different, uh, different mythologies. So yes, there are points of similarity with other Indo-European mythologies and uh, perhaps there are some common stories that can be traced back to or what one imagines can be traced back to the original Indo-European. We can't actually trace them back. But um, but what has been developed in Greece, what's been developed in uh, the Teutonic North, what's been developed amongst the Bolts, what's been developed amongst the Celts, what's been developed amongst the Slavs are all very distinct. Um, and of course, what's been developed in India is very distinct. They have absorbed all sorts of Dravidian elements, I'm sure, in their religion and other elements. So I think, I think also um, the mythologies tend to reflect the character of the people. So there's quite a somber tone in many ways, um, quite a sort of philosophical tone to the northern religion, to Odinism. And when you compare it to the Greek myths, which are wonderful, and of course it's terribly well detailed and well documented, uh, there's lots of uh, joie de vivre, there's lots of um, joy at at the beauty of nature and everything, and, uh, you you know, um, sort of... uh, uh, gaiety, as it were, but I think it's uh, it's a different mood, almost a different mood. Music um, comes across when you look at the Greeks, and and that is as much a difference, I think, as any structural difference. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. It does. I think. Uh, I mean, it, it seems to me. Um, I mean, as you, as you said, I've got I've got no grudge with with Christians of today. I think you know, in the modern day and age paganism its historic roots and christianity for all its wrongs it's done it it's been here an awful long time and i think it it, it would be good for um, people to you know live side by side doing that and stuff but obviously it has the, the well the, i'd say the abrahamic faith so in general have got a lot to answer for in terms of destroying paganism in in europe i mean and also in the middle east and all around the world and it seems to be these pagan faiths are the real truths that are kind of taken, smudged away, and then the Abrahamic faiths are kind of re, uh, reconstructing them to, in, in a way that has manipula- manipulated our ancestors so they embraced it. And it just mm. seems to be part of this globalist, because it's a global rule, isn't it? One God that rules all. Whereas, whereas the pagan stuff seems to be, for me, it's the, 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 non, the more, the more uh, preservation of certain peoples around the world is more peaceful because it's just about the, the look, taking care of things rather than spreading their views over to others. Yes, absolutely. And um, paganism in Europe has been reasserting itself all the time. You know, I mean, you've got the Renaissance. That was a huge reassertion of paganism. Then you have the Romantic movement. Well, there you get different elements of paganism, and particularly the paganism of the North comes in. Um, And in the Victorian time, you have all these um, very learned um, vicars and bishops and so on, um, translating um, ancient northern texts and writing imaginative novels that are based in, in Viking times. Um, uh, they're all ostensibly Christian, uh, but they clearly had a love. They, they were being drawn back to those sources, almost uh, against their better judgment, as it were. And of course, they end up by saying, well, it was inevitable that Christianity is a superior religion. It's inevitable that it had to it had to establish victory in the end. But, but they still have this love and this nostalgia for the old religion. Well, I think we've moved a little bit further now from the Victorian times, and we realize that actually it wasn't inevitable. Um, if it had just been a question of Christians coming in, as Jesus said, and preaching the gospel, if they just preached the gospel, and Jesus does say, by the way, um, that if you go to a village and it rejects you, you just leave that village and wipe the dust off your feet. 
and that's what you do. You don't sort of uh, go in with the, you know, the, the inquisitors and um, burn, burn down their temple. Um, but um, if they just used persuasion, um, they wouldn't, they would have succeeded in, in making an impression and in gaining converts, but they wouldn't have succeeded in the total blanket uh, monolithic supremacy of Christianity, such as we saw in the Middle Ages. It's only because they used force they used the power of the state or the kings, and they used the threat of the pyre and persecution in order to establish themselves. And their aim was the extirpation of every sort of paganism, Odinism, Celtic paganism, Slavonic paganism, Baltic paganism with the Teutonic Knights, everything. Their aim was that there should not be one pagan left standing. And they actually succeeded for a while, but they couldn't repress it. It came back in different forms, as I say, with the Renaissance, the Romantic movement, uh, the great interest in northern literature of the Victorian times. Uh, there were quite a lot of what I would call proto-pagans in Victorian times, you know, in some of the people who wrote um, imaginative um, Viking-style poetry. Um, and... Um, and now with the actual revival of the religions in, in, in more recent decades. So it's, it's, it can't be suppressed, you know, mm. like, a, like a fungus in a way. It was a very attractive <laughs> comparison, but you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I mentioned earlier about certain divisions and so on, which, I mean, I've, I've experienced myself in, in the pagan community worldwide, but I think at the end of the day, it is still a sign that people are being drawn to the old religions, to the uh, to these old pagan ways, it's just so blatant at the moment. And I, I mean, I, I think even even within Christianity, there's some hidden uh, hidden sort of messages within there, or or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, esoteric esoteric um, messages in there, and it's it's pagan rooted. It's almost like it's almost like it's there. It's 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 the truth of of what's there, but just transformed into the into the monotheic um, mm. faith. So to me, it's it's coming back. It is coming back, but at, but in a divided way, I guess that's the only negative thing. It's coming back in so many different ways, but it just it does show what's what's in people's psyche, you know. Uh, I think we have to be authentic in the sense, at least, that the gods and goddesses that we honour are the gods and goddesses of. That, that, that were really part of uh, the, the center of the old religions, rather than trying to invent, as Wicca does, mm. a brand new religion, a brand new form of magic, which and then claiming a false pedigree, historical pedigree for it. Um, we do have to um, abide by the scholarly principles of looking at what that, those religions were like, as far as we can tell, and keeping within that remit, um, and then we are being authentic, as far as we are able to be authentic. I mean, I think in terms of the gods, the gods will look at our very impaired rights, our very limited knowledge, but they understand that we come from, uh, that they have an overview of the whole of centuries, and they understand that we can only do what we can do, being human, mm. and this is what we can do, and uh, it is honourably intended, and they will regard our good intentions. Right. Well, we we are um, pressing on to the uh, with time at the moment. Is there anything you'd like to let our listeners know about um, with regards to what the Odinist Fellowship is up to? Any events, or or just generally, anything you'd like to say to them? Well, I, I say we, we, we um, practice Odinism, and part of that is obviously within our personal lives, and uh, uh, we haven't talked about our ethical beliefs and the nine noble virtues, and part of that is coming together community to honor the gods, because it's very important to offer them sacrifice. The sacrifice of mead is what we offer, the alcoholic beverage based on honey. Um, and in the horn of mead, which is blessed and passed around. And we meet together at the nine major festivals of our sacred calendar. And this is what we do um, season by season, year by year. So this is how we live our lives. But ultimately, we're fighting a great big cosmic battle in alliance with the gods against the forces of disorder, destruction, disintegration, because we're on the side of order, 
nature, life, creativity. Mm. Well, I think um, that's very relevant this week of what's been going on in the news today and in these few days ago. I think there is way too much chaos going out there. And I think, personally, I think that's a sign of lack of spiritual, spiritual connection in the West. I think mm. so many... Mm of western people are just so derooted they don't know who they are they don't know where they're going and it's chaotic and i think um, Mm. it's great seeing people like you pushing this kind of spirituality and i really hope with the plan with Mm. the churches i hope you you come up trumps with that because that'll be great thank you very much thank you very much paul and thank you very much for the time you've given me thanks (laughs) take care (laughs) bye-bye Well, that was Ralph Harrison, the director and founder of the Odinist Fellowship. Very, very interesting talk that. Let me know what you think with your emails. Uh, I really enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more about the Odinist Fellowship, go to www.odinistfellowship.co.uk. Or if you'd like to check out the temple in Newark, um, that's odinisttemple.uk. So maybe you'd like to join the Odinist Fellowship. You can do that by contacting them through the website or just check out some of the more informa- some more information on the temple and so on, which is great. I've got a lot of respect for Ralph for doing this stuff because he's made a, a solid mark in this country with regards to Odinis- Odinism and Arsa True with that temple and, is, and he's got some great ideas. So that's really good. And I, I, I generally think it's, it's always interesting because I think people are reaching out to these pagan faiths that are their root, the roots of who they are as a people and where, where their culture and where their mannerisms and ideas and way of thinking has come from as they have as a people, like, like certain flowers from, from the ground, what, what they are, how you became that flower. You know, it's, it's, um, it's beautiful stuff. And I think it, a lot of people all around the world, um, you know, as you're saying, in other parts of Europe and even, I even heard, um, I heard someone. I haven't. I haven't researched this, so I don't know exactly how true it is. But it's. It was from a uh, genuine source that even people in like Iran and some of these middle Middle Eastern countries are starting to get look at their pagan roots. That before before Islam, their pagan roots. Which uh, I don't know. It's uh, that sounds like a braver thing to do than over here at the moment. But credit to them if they are, because I think that's fantastic that they're doing that as well. Um, but yeah okay I'll I'll stop I'm I'm a bit tired now so I'm just nattering and I'm going to wrap this up thank you all for tuning in and listening again Uh, please let me know what you think about the interview as I say and keep telling your friends about the show keep linking the show more importantly keep downloading the show Um, we're going to be back soon with some other great talks and we're going to be looking forward to you tuning in till the next time take care be strong be brave and we'll be seeing you bye bye